I love fighting games. So much to the point where I made them part of my career, documenting various people and events in the fighting game community. So when Danny asked me if I was interested in telling a story for Noclip, well, there really wasn't a question of where I'd start. While fighting games have grown in popularity in part due to streaming, it's still at its core a grassroots community. In fact, most of the events and broadcasts you see today are still put on by players and fans across the country. But how did it get to this point? Who were some of the earliest FGC streamers and how did they put together what we know today? And what happened when rival broadcasters crossed paths in a world of fierce competition? Our story takes us to New York, home to Victor Spooky Fontanez, creator of Team Spooky, one of the earliest and biggest fighting game streams in the business. So I was born actually uh, in Brooklyn, here in Brooklyn, uh, Methodist Hospital, uh, I'm told is the hospital I was born in. You know, New York at that time was known as a place that a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans immigrated to, and it's not like Puerto Rico's not part of the USA or whatever, but you know what I mean. Lots of PR came out here, and you know, my mom, you know, had me eventually with my dad. They were actually living at a homeless shelter, believe it or not, it's pretty funny, and that's where they met, and they fought their way out of it, and they got a place together. And I mean, where they lived was like, was like real hood or whatever, it was pretty fucked up. But, uh, you know, they were trying to do their best, right? Drugs was a big problem in New York at that time, especially crack. That was the crack days, like the late 70s, the early 80s. That was crack kills. That was even the thing that people would say the slogan, right? So my dad and my mom, that was one of their things. They got into it, unfortunately, as much as they didn't want to. Despite all that happening, one thing that was good for me was that I always had success in school. Like even in like PS or whatever, public school, I would be like on the honor roll, on the high honor roll, and my mom would be super happy about it. Be like, oh, good shit, right? But what I really liked doing was video games. That's always what I was into. I had like an Atari 2600 she gave me for Christmas once, and that's when NDS was out already, but she just found a cheap 2600. I was like, here, take this. And I was hype about it. I was playing like Moon Patrol on it. Combat, I used to love that game when I was a kid. I played that a lot. And then NES, she got me out eventually. I played a lot of Zelda, Zelda 2, uh, adventure games. I was really into that, especially. Later on, around when I became a teenager is when Street Fighter 2 came out. And actually, in the New York area, like, I'm sure it was a big deal everywhere, but in the New York area especially, Street Fighter 2 was a big deal. Like, it wasn't just a game, it was almost like a lifestyle. Like, kids were cutting school just to go to the arcade and play Street Fighter all day long. And then, you know, some kids were, like, traveling around for it and stuff like that. And, you know, people were taking it real serious. Guys were fighting over Street Fighter at the bodega and, you know, all types of stuff. And I was into it, too. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was like a cool thing. It was like this video game where you could, you know, you really were going head to head against a person. It wasn't like something like a type of a two player game where like you both were encouraged to work together or something like that. It was really a game where it was you versus the other guy. And I thought that was pretty cool. I would go to school. I would get up in the morning, and take a shower and go to school. See you later, mom. Right. And as soon as I was done with school and it was three o'clock, I would run to the arcade and my mom would be like, where the hell are you? Maybe I would come home at six o'clock. Maybe I'll come home at one in the morning. <laughs> you know, maybe I would come whatever I felt like it. But that was just because I, you know, I enjoyed playing games and especially Street Fighter at that time. You win. Perfect. While Vic would find himself fascinated with the gameplay of Street Fighter 2, it would eventually act as a gateway to a world of other fighting games and lead him to the one that would make him a fixture of the fighting game community. You know, Street Fighter is known as one game, but there was kind of a big series of games, right? Street Fighter was known as the best of the 2D series of titles, right? That's like a standard side-by-side -side fighting game. Uh, and then Tekken at that time was really big as a 3D fighting game. There was also Soul Calibur and a couple others, but that was the one where you could sidestep and move around your opponent and the graphics all looked super cool because it was 3D, right? Well, uh, there was another game that was different than both those styles and it was called Guilty Gear. And what that game was about was that it was very super animated and it looks like a cartoon. It looks like a little like a Japanese cartoon. It's exactly what the game looks like. And uh, I found that aesthetically, I found that really pleasing myself. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna try to be a Guilty Gear guy for a while. And I tried it out and I wasn't very good at the game, but I enjoyed meeting a lot of the people. And I was like, you know what? This is pretty cool. I'll give it a try, right? Well, uh, at the same time as I was getting into that, there was this Japanese player who was also a Guilty Gear player and his name is Yukinose. So one day he puts up these videos of another game and we're all just like, what is this game? Nobody even knows the name of it, right? And it's Melty, but it's like some old beta version and it's him playing versus a random Guilty Gear friend of his and they're just playing the game, right? So I jumped into it, I tried it out and uh, at first I was trash, just like I was in every other game, but eventually I got pretty decent at it. And as I got better at it, uh, this is just something that happens with fighting games in general. As you get good at a game, people naturally are drawn to you because they start asking you about that game. They're like, hey, you're really good at your character. You know, Can you play me? I want to fight someone who knows what's going on. Or can you teach me some things about the game or whatever? 
So I took advantage of that and I said, well, you know, people seem to really like this. Why don't we do something with it? So we started throwing like small house tournaments, uh, you know, or we would do some stuff near Chinatown Fair, really popular arcade here. Uh, we would go two blocks away, there was a park there, and we would have, you know, multi-blood tournaments on like laptops in the park or something, and it worked out really well. There was also a free outlet by a Snapple machine about 100 yards away, and they would have tournaments there as well. They would hook up a lot. They would actually have, you know, like a power strip hooked up to that one outlet by the Snapple machine and run a laptop and a bunch of other stuff out of it. All Jersey Grand Finals! Yeah, Jersey! Represent, go back home! Rep what? Go I'll go back home, home with New York's money. Ooh. I think if you dig, like, real deep in the crypts of YouTube, you can find uh, old match videos from the old BBGs, and it was usually Vic or Master Chibi, uh, one of those two guys, either with a camera or with a um, recording equipment, not necessarily hooked up to a laptop, but like a DVR, you know, so you could record it and then go back and edit it later. Yeah, he was there recording it and running it. Nowadays, capturing and sharing gameplay is pretty easy. Programs such as OBS and platforms like YouTube even let you do so for free. If a player wanted to learn a new combo or do research on an upcoming opponent, that information is only a click away. But in the early days of fighting games, players and fans had to resort to more creative measures. For me, the first pieces of media around fighting games that I remember, one sadly was magazines where you try and like paste frames together and be like, okay, I think I understand what they're saying is the combo in this game. And then you're like, but that's not even a combo, right? Like they, the guys writing the magazines didn't always even understand. But from there, the thing I really remember coveting was what were called TZW tapes. And he was a Japanese combo maker who would record crazy combos with Guile. Um, but because, you know, we didn't have the source for the VHS tapes, they would be dubbed from one to another. And each time someone made a recording of the tape, it would degrade the quality. So a lot of times by the time, you know, I would be stuffing, you know, cash dollar bills into an envelope and mailing it to some weirdo in Ohio who'd send you back a copy of the tape. And sometimes it was so filled with fuzz and lines that you could just see sort of the feet moving and hear the sounds and the rest would be kind of blurry but I could tell what combos they were doing by listening to the sounds and seeing where the feet were. And I'd be like, cool. <laughs> so back, back before like Justin TV and Ustream and now Twitch, you know, you didn't have these streaming services that were necessarily free even, they just didn't even exist. Um, so what you did is you recorded videos and then you either had a torrent for them or put them on YouTube or some other video site so people could watch them. Or you'd have some FTP server and you'd put the link on like, sure you can. When tournaments started getting going, one of the first things that I remember Eva was a little ahead of the game on was trying to produce like a DVD recording matches and stuff like that. But it was just really difficult and it took a ton of time to edit it down. And then I think the DVDs would usually ship six, eight months after the event. So it's a long time, but the idea of getting match footage was just, you didn't really think about it, um, which made it harder to improve in a lot of ways, but also had the interesting effect of you didn't really know who was the best. So you kind of had to get together to, to hash that out. Spooky would continue playing fighting games and become more involved with recording events, supporting himself and his hobby with working various jobs, including a stint as an IT tech in New York City. His hobby, however, started to become more enjoyable than his job, leading him to take a leap of faith. So I took all the money that I had saved at that time, and I had a 401k, all money that I saved up from them. And I was like, you know what, I don't need this 401k yet. So I cashed that out, right? And I decided to get into live streaming for whatever reason, I just felt like it. It wasn't even like I thought that this was a job that was gonna get me money. So out of my crappy basement apartment, I would live stream. I didn't know Jack, all I knew was look things up online. I said I knew very little about like focus and aperture and what type of lighting you might need and tech, even techniques like rule of thirds and things like that. No, no, none. Back in the day when things first got started, uh, we're talking about really going back to like 2009, right? Uh, there wasn't like i7 yet. There wasn't too many multi-core processors or anything like that. There was like dual core, I think was the hot shit. It was like, well, you got a dual core, you're the man, right? That's where we were, right? So knowing that CPU was a big limiting factor and also price was a big limiting factor back then. People didn't really know what they wanted. People didn't have a way to generate revenue yet on Twitch or even on YouTube, you could generate revenue, but it wasn't a lot of revenue, right? So there wasn't value there in spending a lot of money. So back then, uh, most guys, uh, including myself, would have like a webcam, 
like your basic BS web camera, right? And what I did was I bought some hand mics, the regular old Shure SM58s, the classics, right? I got two Shure SM58s and that's what guys would be doing. So it's your web camera pointing at the guys and two guys would have a hand mic and they talk. And I had the cheapest possible mixer you could get, a really dirt cheap mixer, and I would plug that into the setup. Even off the bat, I had small success. Like I, day one, I had 25 people watching me already. And it was all my friends that just knew me from Facebook or Twitter or whatever else, right? Just all guys are also fighting game guys. But still, that's a, a pretty good start for a, your day one stream. What's up guys, this is Spooky. Um, first off, I got some bad news. Um, we made too much damn noise in this place and we're getting evicted. Um, it doesn't immediately affect our schedule of upcoming events. <laughs> I didn't know him very well, but I knew what he did and I started to watch. And when he started doing it regularly, like, I was kind of an early cord cutter with the TV, but that became quickly my TV. I was just like, well, this is better than TV, like by a lot. So not only was it great entertainment and did I get to see a lot of great fights, but I also got to know some of the guys, um, you know, familiar to anybody who's watching streams today, but you really get to feel like you start to get some insight into the broadcasters as well as the cast of characters, sort of behind the scenes and in front of the camera and playing and stuff like that and it just made it a super rich experience in exactly the same ways that fighting games had always been. Uh, so exciting to me is really, it's the games and the decisions people make in the games, but also who are the people making those decisions? And when you bring that all together, like, like uh, I think Vic was uh, pioneering with, yeah, that's just a, that's a really incredible package. Tons of blocking. That block button gets some serious use right now. Timeout, this might be a timeout, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Joey's no, by timeout! Holy sh! That's not good enough! I'm upset That's it. bullshit! While quality and reliability would become signatures of a team Spooky stream, they weren't alone. In fact, Spooky would always start and end his streams with two very memorable acts. One of them is, hey guys, this is Spooky on the mic. What's up, guys? <laughs> like, what's up, guys? This is Spooky on the mic. What's up, guys? This is Spooky. What's up, guys? This is Spooky. What's up, guys? This is Spooky. All the time. You go back, you watch any video, the first thing Vic always says is this is Spooky on your mic. Like, you don't know it's him by then. You know, like, yeah, nobody knows you by now, Vic. Go ahead and introduce yourself again. Like, yeah, we know it's you. And then, of course, uh, being set free. At the end of every stream, or almost every stream, he'll do the... Uh, He'll play this clip from, I guess, this old kung fu film. I'm not sure what film it is, but it's dubbed over, and it's this guy punching down a wall, and he turns around and he says, You're all free now! Yeah! And that was supposed to be setting the stream monsters free. Technically, it's like the end of the stream, you can go. It's a nice coda on the broadcast to let you know, like, it's over, but also, a weird sense of community from a fairly random, uh, basically meme-like clip. For sure, one of the primary virtues of Vic and his approach to streaming was that kind of, I guess I look at it as authenticity, both about the players, uh, about who he is as an individual, but also like straight up what's going on with the tournament, what's going on with the stream. Like, oh, we blew a camera, this thing shorted out, like this guy's stick broke. This machine is, you know, whatever. Whatever it was, we just tell you. Listen up, here's what we're gonna do. Apparently, Jason Cole and his crew couldn't get together in time for the Dojo Sports 5v5. We're on a very, very tight schedule. And um, li literally, this needs to start in like 15 minutes and everybody's not here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do multi-blood, actress again, top eight, and then we're gonna proceed with the rest of the schedule. Right, so rather than like mysterious break or like, yeah, don't, don't worry about it, everything's great. Like, he would just give you the honest, straight dope, sort of, uh, and I think that helped people develop a real level of trust, um, both in what he was gonna do and the choices he was gonna make. You know, they were, uh, Esteban's working about that documentary on, on me, and sure enough, some asshole on Twitter was like, does it cost $5 to watch a documentary? <laughs> does it cost $5 for you to go fuck yourself? No, <laughs> There's a certain directness to New Yorkers that I think really came through in him, and I think really helped establish that bond between the audience and Team Spooky as a, as a crew. While Spooky would continue to stream fighting games, they weren't that popular at the time due to a long period of little to no new games. That all changed, however, in 2008 with the release of Street Fighter IV as it brought in a ton of old and new fans back to fighting games. And when Spooky found himself with an early copy of its eagerly awaited update, opportunity struck. Street Fighter IV came out in 2009, and that was a, a pretty good deal for the fighting game guys. Uh, Street Fighter III was a good game and very cool, 
but uh, it didn't really get the worldwide exposure that Street Fighter 2 did for whatever reason. I saw the Daigo parry, that was a big deal, right? So people knew about that, but they still didn't really care about Third Strike. They mostly cared about, oh, Daigo's so godlike, fighting game tournaments are awesome. That was like general attitude, right? But when SF4 came out, everyone was excited because they were like, this is my chance to start from the beginning. And I mean, I'm talking about Super Scrubs, were like, well, I could be the next guy go. And the good guys were like, well, I'm gonna be the next guy go. That was everybody's attitude. They just wanted to be the next big guy. Everybody was into it. Lots of tournaments, people were traveling to Japan just to play, all this stuff, right? Uh, and eventually, they decided to announce an expansion they called it Super Street Fighter 4. And of course, everybody was excited, like, great, we're gonna get new characters and new stages, and all the stupid things that we think are not balanced about the game are gonna leave. People were even more excited even, I think, than the original Street Fighter 4 release. That's how big it was. So we decided, hey, we're gonna get a bunch of people to play in my basement, similar to like I would do with Melty, and we're gonna play Street Fighter 4 early, Super Street Fighter 4, and see what it's about. And I remember they had a whole bunch of players from around the US, uh, from West Coast, come over and they had like concept matches and they'd interview after it and stuff and it was really good. So I remember watching those. He was just such a, a, a pillar that he could get whoever he wanted. So when he got all those guys to come out for that Street Fighter 4, like those first weeks, that was huge. And it was like a back and forth. Guys would come to the house and then they would leave and other guys would come and then they would leave. And I mean, it was like a week long, 24 hours. We don't care, we're just gonna keep doing Street Fighter 4 and get good at the game before it comes out. Were you at Capcom at the time? Oh yeah, Super Street Fighter 4 was, that was my baby. Yeah, I mean, officially, like it's, it's not great to have that kind of stuff out there. Uh, I think there's all sorts of reasons why companies work hard to try and uh, protect stuff and make sure it goes out the way they can. There's a lot of money and a lot of people's careers sort of riding on it. But on the other side, uh, I knew I could trust those guys to do a great job. And I knew that Super Street Fighter 4 was a great game and I really believed in the product. So I knew they were gonna do good stuff with it. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that you could <laughs> uh, be sort of openly excited or endorsing. And you know, you're still worried that, the, that maybe they'll hate it and like, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, but that's how it goes. And uh, to see the game, to see the passion that led them to try and do that, I totally get it. And uh, I've been on the other side of that myself. And uh, I think they did good work. They really, they really made the game. They, they helped people understand the game, which is at the end of the day what it's all about. We had like a thousand viewers was the peak or something like that. We had so many viewers that we found a limitation on Justin TV that I didn't know about. So Justin TV at that time, whenever you had a thousand viewers or more, uh, it would kick international viewers off the site, right? We found that out the hard way at that stream because we got like a thousand people and then people kept saying, Spooky, I'm getting kicked out. I'm watching from like, you know, the Netherlands or from Japan or from the UK or something and I can't watch anymore. But uh, Justin.TV, they decided they wanted to rebrand into a new site called Twitch.tv. And the idea behind it was that they cared about competitive gaming. That's what they cared about the most. And that's what was most successful on me on the broadcast too, was competitive gaming. That was what was going well, right? So Kevin Lin, who was the COO, I want to say was his job title, uh, he sends me a message one day and he's like, hey, you know, Spooky, what's up? You used to be on Justin TV, but I see now you're on Ustream. Well, what would it take for you to come back? So I was like, all right, you know what, whatever. I'll write him a letter, right? So I wrote him an email back and I told him all the things I needed. The number one thing was I needed no viewer limit. Like, you know, even if it goes past a thousand people, I want international people to be able to watch. And they're like, okay, well done, right? And I was like, okay, well, I'll give this a try. The Super Street Fighter 4 stream would solidify Team Spooky as the go-to streaming team on the East Coast. With help from fellow members such as Min Ahn, Arturo Sanchez, and Josh Jodoin, Spooky began to broadcast events outside of his house, such as tournaments and exhibitions. The tournament we're actually doing this interview at right now, Next Level Battle Circuit, is the current iteration of one of the longest running weekly tournaments on the East Coast and has been streamed by Team Spooky since its inception almost eight years ago. Its placement on Wednesday nights brought it to compete with Wednesday Night Fights, another long running weekly tournament from the West Coast put on by Level Up Productions a broadcasting company founded by Street Fighter veteran Alex Valle and his friend Jimmy Wynn. With the two broadcasting on the same night, a rivalry was born, and the Wednesday Night Wars had begun. They both, I think, had a bigger view of what streaming could be and the possibilities. I think both kind of wanted to be best in class, and they had sort of a different set of virtues, sort of, I think, Alex was more focused on sort of a professional, sort of like clean, smooth kind of thing, and I think Vic was sort of more focused on like Let's just keep it real at all, all fronts. Um, I think both influenced by their respective coasts, but the history of fighting games has a long history of competition, part, primarily between the two coasts and often between New York and LA. And so to see that sort of 
bleed over into the streaming world just seemed really natural at the time to me. For a while it was um, Team Spooky and Level Up. Your event has one or the other, right? And I think Spooky had his foot in the door in more events than Level Up did. So in terms of just how many hours you were you know, broadcasting, Vic was definitely at the forefront, especially with all the weekly events and stuff he would do. And he wouldn't just do majors. He would do, you know, large locals or something, you know, he would, he would travel and bring his equipment out and help promote an event if you wanted it and paid for it. So, uh, you know, when I came along and I was doing this, right, keep in mind that, uh, you know, there's, there's, in the same way that we play fighting games when we're trying to be competitive, there's competition there and that I want the East Coast to be presented in a good light, especially compared to the West Coast. I don't want everyone to say that the West Coast is the best and the East Coast sucks and there's nothing on the East. You gotta always be in the West, right? But, you know, it wasn't really about being by it and it was more like, what they're doing is super cool, right? I just wanna do the same thing that they're doing over here on my coast because I think it's cool. A lot of people think that's about who wins the Wednesday Night War, right? But okay, who wins matters a little bit, right? Like whoever got the most viewers that day means that they get the most profit and the sponsors sometimes are looking at that, you know, and looking for who's getting the most, right? But what's really important, the most of all, is that there is a war in the first place because then people would tune into me as early as possible and then the minute that the stream's over, okay, I even would host them. Like, the minute that the stream's over, bam, everyone will go straight to level up. And that was big shit. And sometimes I would have 10,000 people watching me and then you would go to level up and 6,000 of those 10,000 were already there the minute the stream started and they would build up to like 9,000 or 10,000 even. Sometimes they would get more than me and I'd be like, wow, this is fucking great. Everybody's getting numbers, right? The thing for me as a guy who's just enjoying the streams, I was confident that it's gonna make everybody better. And uh, I like that competition to sort of put a little fire under everybody's ass with like, hey, you're being tested here. Like they've got this new stream overlay or this is what they're doing here. They have a new transition or it's all this little, you know, kind of insider stuff. While the rivalry between the two companies would continue, Level Up would always have an ace in the hole. They were the main broadcasters for EVO, the largest open entry fighting game tournament in the world. Even if you've never played a fighting game before, you've probably heard that name. Every year, thousands of competitors travel to Vegas to compete against one another to see who's the best in their respective games. And while EVO has become a spectacle over the years, it still ran and organized by community members, making it a cornerstone of the FGC. For a long time, Level Up was the broadcasting team at EVO. However, that all changed in 2010 when, during the Super Street Fighter IV Grand Final set between Japanese legend Daigo Umahara and NorCal's Ricky Ortiz, now oh, that's gonna oh. be good. the stream crashed. When the stream went down in 2010, I was, yeah, not in an ideal position to sort of figure out what was going on because it was talking into the mic and I think we didn't really even know that it had gone down, so we probably just kept talking. Um, but you could tell that there was an, an issue. Uh, and, you know, I trusted the rest of the team to sort of sort that out. Um, but when I got the news later, it was, it was definitely, it was a bummer just because we knew, uh, you know, streaming still being a kind of a new thing. We knew how important it was to a wider audience and we knew how much work had gone into sort of getting it set up on the back end. And everybody had put a lot of time and effort into trying to make sure it had gone right. And for whatever reason, it, it didn't. And it was an incredible set. And, and so to have that as sort of a, a, a down note was like getting the, the wind knocked out of you a little bit. The community really liked Vic. Like Vic just wasn't some guy, you know? He wasn't just some guy streaming. People really, really liked him. They adored him. Everybody knew him. So they'd be like, well, why isn't Vic doing this? Like all of Vic's streams are good. Hey, get Vic to do it. Why aren't you having Vic doing your streams? And then, yeah, there was a huge community push to get him in there. And uh, a lot of people asked for it. You know, streaming today is still difficult back then you're dealing with a lot of, you know, crazy software that explodes all the time. So the fact that the stream went down was sort of more of a regular occurrence and it just happened to be at a terrible time during EVO. Uh, but I think what really galvanized people behind uh, seeing Spooky give a shot was that kind of connection they had with him as an individual where they trusted him to, to tell them and to do the best that he could. The community's push for Spooky to stream EVO would follow him into final round 14, a major tournament in Atlanta, Georgia. With the tournament awarding winners EVO seeding points and attracting international players and viewers, this would be the biggest and most demanding broadcast for Team Spooky yet and serve as the test for a possible EVO run. Once 
Once again, let everybody know, sure you can Neo Gaff Event Hubs. If you're in the Capcom channel right now, I'm not in there. Blow it up. All your friends, you know the deal as always. Blow it up on Twitter, Facebook, wherever. We're in there. Final round 14. Uh, this was the first time that I was asked to broadcast final round. That year, okay, if you watch Larry Shinblanca, you'll be able to remember probably 80% of this and maybe 20% of it I'm a little off on, okay? But I came in that tournament and it wasn't just a broadcast, okay? I had to help them even figure out their form layout and what was gonna get plugged into where because they were trying to have like electrical cords going across the floor and all this crazy stuff. And we helped with the schedule and we tried to improve it so that it would work as a broadcast schedule and not just as like, a tournament schedule forced onto a broadcast. Yeah, and yeah, in terms of like the production of the whole event, he started to really, I don't know if it was final round 14, but maybe even before that, he'd be like, hey, you know, we need this much space to do this. But then on top of that, he'd be like, why are you guys setting up your ballroom like this? Like it should be like this, or why are you routing your power like this? It should probably be like this. So I think he started to get into like actually helping run your event, not just the production. The production is very important but when you're a competitor there, there are a whole lot of other things that come into play. So I think he would really try and get on the, the tournament's case on, listen, you need to do this so you have a good event because if I'm at your event, I'm gonna be associated with it. So if I'm streaming a bad event, it's gonna reflect negatively on me. Even if my stream is good, he still wants to be part of a good event and he wants to make it a good event. But Final Round was a tournament that helped me care more about supporting every game and making sure that broadcast was not just about Street Fighter and not just about one particular game, but that you know all the major games that the community were coming for at the, that event would hopefully be represented in some way on the broadcast. Final Round 14 would certainly become a memorable event in the community's history, with moments such as New York City's fighting GM defeating Atlanta's Anakin on his home turf in Tekken 6. Oh my god! Oh! God! That's he it! Is it. Finish it off with a four and three string! PR Balrog with an upset victory over Japan's Tokido in Super Street Fighter 4. Oh, oh, oh my god! Puerto Rican Balrog wins final round Super Street Fighter 4 over oh, Tokido! And an incredible comeback from Combo Fiend in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Bionic, Bionic arm. arm! Bionic arm! OTG! Bionic arm! Giving Sid, he has another chance. He's done! Oh! He's done! 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 The event would be so successful, it would lead Spooky to make a public plea to the crowd and viewers urging them to keep asking the EVO staff to have Team Spooky at EVO 2011. While footage of the latter no longer exists, Spooky would make his case with, quote, I'm gonna keep it real. My streams don't go down in grand finals. Keep it 100% real. Thank you very much. Everybody, you know, just kind of went, whoa, okay. We, we obviously know what that's talking to, like, oh yeah, Evo. My attitude was, I don't give a fuck about Vi. And it was, you know, I respected his work, and I thought that Wednesday Night Fights was dope, but I didn't give a crap. I thought that, don't go on like that in Grand Finals Evo. I, my attitude at that time was, I would never let that happen. That's what I was thinking at that time. Yeah, I do remember uh, the, the sort of, the call out uh, about my stream doesn't go down in Grand Finals. And, for someone like me, an old man who's been on the scene for a long time and knows how fragile it can be in some ways, my heart breaks a little bit when, when people are sort of going at each other, but I also understood it because it's, this is a competitive bunch, right, who wants to challenge themselves and push themselves further. And I felt like, you know, Vic, from his perspective, felt like he'd been putting in the work, uh, had a really solid set of presentation, and then now here at Final Round is really like evidence that I can handle not just sort of smaller streams, I can handle things at, at the big scale, at the big stage. And uh, at the same time, right, I don't, I think we're all stronger together than, than trying to tear each other down, but I understand wanting to take that shot at the brass ring and being like, hey, like, hear me, like, I can do this. If you think of Evo as an entity, right, no matter who is streaming, when something like that happens and you address it, you're not just calling out like a single person, you're calling out the whole event. By Vic saying, my stuff doesn't go out, he's like, you made the wrong decision. It should have been me. You're, you're calling out the guys that are running the biggest event that would probably like be paying your paycheck, saying, 
Yeah, you made a terrible decision. Hope that takes some balls. You should ask if there's something you want, you should ask for it. And you know, we can quibble about whether that's the best way to ask for it or whether there was a cooler way that that could have been done. But uh, I think he made a pretty strong point and you know, the rest is history. Team Spooky and Level Up would patch things up shortly after the incident, but the message was clear. Team Spooky for Evo. To help ease concerns, Spooky would team up with the NorCal-based production team, I Play Winner, to give themselves the tools and staff needed to cover such a huge event. However, there was one more obstacle in their way, IGN. It was interesting because you had to be sort of reflective about what is this event all about? What does it really mean to people? What does it mean to the people watching here? And I think it's obviously more than just people who are great at a video game or people who are coming a long ways. But I think the narrative for a long time had been all about uh, with gaming had been the only way you can make a wider audience care is by putting a big sack of money on top of it and being like, hey, you have to care because it's a million dollars. Um, so even though you don't care about this game, that's why you should care about this game. And that always just seemed like kind of a bad answer to me. So we were always interested in um, trying to explore sort of more of the human side of that. But as the media got bigger and bigger, we also realized that like, maybe the interests of the media and the interests of this group of players aren't always the same, right? Before it just seemed like, hey, we're doing a cool thing. Media can help broadcast that message and maybe people will find it and, and come and be a part of this community and that's great. But as some of those integrations, you know, they wanted more and more, you started to realize like, hey, maybe this is like not as good for our audience um, or for, for the FGC itself. And I think that was, that was, Thinking back about it now, that was a real turning point year and one of the, <laughs> I choke up real easy. <laughs> but it was a, it was a turning point, um, I think for the way Evo thought of itself was IGN had come in and done a thing and they're great guys and a lot of great people there. And I think they wanted to do it again the next year, it was maybe 2009 or 2010. And the answer was like, nah. Like IGN, you know, the biggest gaming web, I think it might be still the biggest gaming website in the world. Uh, wants to come and do like a co-production with this, you know, the Evo thing and should be kind of everything you asked for. And it was like, well, you know, whatever, 100, 200 million dollar conglomerate, like we're going with Spooky. And they're like, who is Spooky Co? And you're like, that's this guy. <laughs> it's, it's this guy, Vic. He's this guy from New York. He's, we like him. So <laughs> it's basically telling like IGN, like, You've lost the contract to this dude from New, from New York. It's just this guy. And that felt like deeply right. Like that was like, yes, this is the right decision, but also like kind of a nuts decision. I think from the perspective of Evo, there's always been kind of a commitment to try and uh, spread things out a little bit, to try and bring people into the fold and like seeing somebody who's uh, got an ambition and got a goal uh, have a chance to reach that is really what EVO is all about. EVO 2011 will become one of the biggest successes in the event's history, reaching over 2 million unique viewers. Since then, Spooky has become a mainstay of the tournament's broadcasting team as it's evolved over the years. In fact, if you wait till the end of an EVO broadcast, you might just see a familiar sight. Since EVO 2011, Team Spooky has continued to stream fighting games all over the world. With over 257,000 followers and close to 90 million views, the Team Spooky Twitch channel has become one of the biggest channels for fighting games. While many hold Spooky in high regard for the work he's done, he tends to disagree. You know, some guys, when they would do something like that, right, I guess they would feel a sense of accomplishment. Like, I accomplished something. I did this, right? With me, no, it was more like, no, this is my job to do this and make sure that this doesn't suck. And then at the end, everyone's happy, right? And I'm like, cool, you guys are all happy? And I kind of scratch my head and go home. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's like a, maybe that's like a mental thing for me or like a sociological thing or something. I don't know, man. I don't, like, I don't take pleasure in accomplishment as much as other people do. I take pleasure when other people are pleased. I personally don't feel uh, 
holy shit, T Spooky made it, woo! Like, I don't personally feel that type of pleasure of this. I feel good when other people are like, man, Defend the North went so fucking good and actually everything ran on time and the stream was pretty cool. Those things make me feel a lot better. I, you know, Vic's, Vic's view of himself is very, you know, sort of self-deprecating, like I'm just a guy like everybody else. But I think that uh, while it sounds sort of limiting or, or makes it smaller or something, I actually think that's sort of part of the core of how he's able to connect with so many people. Because the things that he is about are things that we can all be about. And he doesn't have necessarily like a grandiose vision of the future. He treats it day to day like a job. Here's what I gotta do. I gotta get this done, get this done, this done. It's also kind of the right attitude for a tournament. Like even as a tournament player, like that's your job. Like maybe you'll become like an esports millionaire on a private jet somewhere, but your job is just to beat that guy. You just have to go beat one guy, beat the next guy. That's what it is. That's the gig. And I think his approach to sort of streaming and sort of, this is the job, just do it, see where it goes, we'll try and do our best, uh, is really kind of resonant with that. And his set of uh, personal values and core FGC values uh, strongly overlap. And so to see like Vic's influence spread everywhere is really just a lot of the core values of the FGC that happen to be embodied in a guy. And it's nice to be able to put a face on it and be like, yeah, that guy. He's like me, and I'm like this group, and together we're some big stupid family. <laughs>